We Are the Other People by Oberon Zell, Part 2 Genesis 3, 8 The man and his wife heard the sound of Yahweh God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from Yahweh God among the trees of the garden. Genesis 3, 9 But Yahweh God called to the man, Where are you? he asked. Genesis 3, 10 I heard the sound of you in the garden, he replied. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Genesis 3.11 Who told you you were naked, he asked. Have you been eating of the tree I forbade you to eat? And so the sign of the fall becomes modesty. Take note of this. The descendants of Adam and Eve will be distinguished throughout history from virtually all other peoples by their obsessive modesty taboos wherein they will feel ashamed of being naked. It follows that those who feel no shame in being naked are by definition not carriers of this spiritual disease of original sin. Genesis 3.12 The man replied, It was the woman you put with me. She gave me the fruit and I ate it. Right. Blame the woman. What a turkey. Genesis 3.13 Then... Yahweh God asked the woman, What is this you have done? The woman replied, The serpent tempted me, and I ate. So, of course, she blames the serpent. But just what did the serpent do that was so evil? Why, he called Yahweh a liar. Was he wrong? Let's see. Genesis 3.21 Yahweh God made clothes out of skins for the man and his wife, and they put them on out of skins. This means that Yahweh had to kill some innocent animals to pander to Adam and Eve's new obsession with modesty. And now we come to the crux of the fall. Yahweh had said back there in chapter 217 regarding the fruit of the tree of knowledge that on the day you eat of it you shall most surely die. The serpent on the other hand had contradicted Yahweh in chapters 3, 4 through 5. No, you will not die. God knows, in fact, that on the day you eat it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God's, knowing good and evil. So, what actually happened? Who lied, and who told the truth about this remarkable fruit? The answer is given in the next verse, Genesis 3.22. Then Yahweh God said, See, the man has become like one of us. With his knowledge of good and evil, he must not be allowed to stretch his hand out next and pick from the tree of life also, and then eat some and live forever. Get that? Yahweh himself admits that he had lied. In fact, in Yahweh's own words, the serpent spoke the absolute truth. And moreover, Yahweh tells the rest of the pantheon, that he intends to evict Adam, and presumably Eve as well, to keep them from gaining immortality to go with the newly acquired divine knowledge, to prevent them, in other words, from truly becoming gods. So, who in this story comes off as a benefactor of humanity? Who comes off as the tyrant? The serpent never lied. This story, to digress slightly, bears a remarkable resemblance to a contemporary tale from ancient Greece. In that version, the serpent, later identified as Lucifer, the light-bearer, may be equated with the heroic titan Prometheus, who championed humanity against the tyranny of Zeus, who wished for people to be mere slaves of the gods. Prometheus, whose name means forethought, gave people wisdom, intelligence, and fire stolen from Olympus. Moreover, he ordained the portions of animal sacrifice so that humans got the best part, the meat and hides, while the portion that was burned to the gods was the bones and fat. In punishment for this defiance of his divine authority, Zeus condemned Prometheus to a terrible punishment for an immortal, to be chained to a mountain in the Caucasus where Zeus's griffin, or eagle, would devour his liver each day. It would grow back each night. Zeus promised to relent if Prometheus would reveal his great secret knowledge, who would succeed Zeus as supreme god. Prometheus refused to tell, but history has revealed the answer.
The interesting thing about all this is that the Greeks properly regarded Prometheus as a noble hero in his defiance of unjust tyranny. One may wonder why the serpent is not so well regarded. On the contrary, snakes are loathed throughout Christendom. Genesis 3.23 So Yahweh God expelled him from the Garden of Eden to till the soil from which he had been taken. Genesis 3.24 He banished the man, and in front of the Garden of Eden he posted the cherubs and the flame of a flashing sword to guard the way to the tree of life. So that's it for the fall. But the story of Adam and Eve doesn't end there. Genesis 4.1 the man had intercourse with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. Genesis 4.2 She gave birth to a second child, Abel, the brother of Cain. Now Abel became a shepherd and kept flocks, while Cain tilled the soil. Genesis 4.3 Time passed, and Cain brought some of the produce of the soil as an offering to Yahweh. Genesis 4.4 4. While Abel, for his part, brought the firstborn of his flock and some of their fat as well. Yahweh looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but he did not look with favor on Cain and his offering. Cain was very angry and downcast. Well, why shouldn't he be? Both brothers had brought forth their first fruits as offerings, but Yahweh rejected the vegetables and only accepted the blood sacrifice. This was to set a gruesome precedent. Genesis 4.8 Cain said to his brother Abel, Let us go out. And while they were in the open country, Cain set on his brother Abel and killed him. Accursed and marked for fratricide, Genesis 4.16, Cain left the presence of Yahweh and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. We can assume that the phrase, left the presence of Yahweh, implies that Yahweh is a local deity and not omnipresent. Now, Eden, according to Genesis 2:14 through 15, was situated at the source of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, apparently right where Lake Van is now in Turkey. East of Eden, therefore, would probably be along the shores of the Caspian Sea, right in the Indo-European heartland. Cain settled in there among the people of Nod and married one of the women of the country. Here, for the first time, is specifically mentioned the other people, who were not of the lineage of Adam and Eve, i.e., the pagans. So let us look at this story from another viewpoint. There we were, around 6,000 years ago, living in our little farming communities around the Caspian Sea in the land of Nod, when this dude with a terrible scar comes stumbling out in the sunset. He tells us this bizarre story about how his mother and father had been created by some god named Yahweh and put in charge of a beautiful garden somewhere out west, and how they had gotten thrown out for disobedience after eating some of the landlord's forbidden magic fruit of enlightenment. He tells us of murdering his brother, as the god of his parents would only accept blood sacrifice and receiving that scar as a mark so that all would know him as a fratricide. The poor guy is really a mess psychologically. Obsessed with guilt, he is also obsessively modest insisting on wearing clothes even in the hottest summer. And he has a hard time with our penchant for skinny dipping in the warm inland sea. He seems to believe that he is tainted by the sin of his parents' disobedience, that it is in his blood somehow, and he will continue to contaminate his children and his children's children. One of our healing women takes pity on the poor sucker and marries him. Genesis 4.17 Cain had intercourse with his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. He became builder of a town, and gave the town the name of his son, Enoch. With both their first sons not turning out very well, Adam and Eve decided to try again.